Everybody. Good morning and welcome to Above Bar. My name is Ruth and it's my privilege to welcome you here this morning. Um, welcome to those of you here in the building and hello to those of you at home as well. Um, before we dive into the service, just a couple bit of bits of quick housekeeping. Firstly, um, if you are new here, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, we'd love to welcome you. So um, please do make yourself known to someone with um, a red lanyard on who know what they're doing. They're part of our welcome team and they'd love to formally welcome you on behalf of the church. Um, please do also um, fill out a welcome card on our website as well and someone from our church will be in touch with you. Um, secondly, if you're sat in the designated face covering um, area upstairs, please do uh, wear a face covering. Thank you so much. Um, super. So this term, um, here in the auditorium, we have been discovering more about God's amazing plan for his church around the world, but also here at Above Bar, um, as we work through um, a book called Ephesians. And for those of us who've been here for the journey, it's been wonderful, hasn't it? Um, we're going to start our time together by reading some amazing verses from the start of that book and celebrating all that Jesus has done for us in dying for us and in giving himself up for us. So for those who are able, I'd invite you to stand. And we're going to read these verses together. Do enjoy them as you read them. These are God's love for you and for us together. So let's read. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. We're going to sing now and celebrate Jesus and his love for us. Thanks, Chris. Yes, I'll blow. 
great glory. You have done great things. Amen. Please do take your seats. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed, but I said something a little bit tricky to get our heads around before we sung. I said, Jesus gave himself up for us. We're going to have a little think about what that means. And Sean and Ivan and Duncan are going to come and help me. Let's give them a clap as they come on up. Okay. So I'd like you to imagine that it is a Saturday morning in the Kennedy household and they have been out for a lovely time at the park and they come home and they are absolutely starving, okay? And as they come into the kitchen, you're going to open up the cake tin. Yeah, and have a look what's inside. Now you're all starving. What's inside? We've got, oh dear, we've got two delicious cake bars and one moldy, fairly shriveled satsuma. Now, Dad, Sean, we're thinking about what giving yourself up for your boys might look like. Yeah. What are you going to have to do, I'm afraid? Um, oh, let me give you a microphone. Sorry, they can't hear you. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to have the moldy satsuma. Oh, well done, Sean. Here we go, boys. There we are. <laughs> right, Sean, on a scale of one to ten, how hard was that? Well, if ten is hard... Yeah, sorry, ten's hard, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think it was ten. A yeah. ten? Oh, I wow. really wanted a cake. <laughs> yeah. Super, Dad. Now, I'm afraid our story doesn't end here, because these boys are very hungry, and now it's lunchtime, and on the menu today are yummy beans on toast. Now, Dad is going to, Sean's going to pour the baked beans into the jug to warm them up in the microwave. Oh, they're a bit stuck. Might have to give them a bit of a shake. Hold that. Hold that. Yeah, we don't want that getting covered in baked beans, do we? Look, it's working. It is working. Woo! Here we go. Now, some yummy. <laughs> there we go. Lovely. So, we've got our baked beans. So, we've got our baked beans, and Sean just turns his back to put the toast in the toaster. And as all stories happen, um, the, Dunk the Kennedy boys are doing some scuba diving with their little men, and uh-oh! Oh, no! They landed in the baked beans! The scuba divers have landed in the baked beans. <laughs> now, Dad... <laughs> they landed in the baked beans! Now, Dad, you are giving yourself up for your boys. Yeah. What are you going to have to do? I think I'm going to have to get my hand dirty. Yeah, I haven't got any spoons, I'm afraid, so... Dad, hero to the rescue. Yeah. Oh. Here we go. Dad has rescued our scuba divers. Big round of applause for Sean, please. Oh, no, he hasn't. Not yet. Oh. Okay. Sean, if giving up a chocolate cake was hard, how hard was it to get your baked bean hand, handle baked beanie? Well, I think that was a 12. Probably. A 12. It's off the scale. <laughs> I yeah, I think Dad does need to wash his hands. Well done. Right, let's give the Kennedy family oh, a big round of applause, please. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, boys. You can go and, you can go and sit down. Thank you. Now, that was a very silly example. And I'm sorry, I have a three-year-old at home, so I think my um, brain is into toddler things. But um, hopefully that example showed us a little bit, a very small shadow of what Jesus does for us. He gives up everything that she, he should have had in heaven and came down to earth. And he took, on, um, the, the, he took on all the bad things in the world and he took on our guilt and our shame on the cross. Um, so that is a small shadow of what Jesus has done for us. In Philippians 2, verse 6, it says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming to death, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Can I invite those of us who are able to stand and we're going to pray and thank Jesus for his love for us. So everyone, arms up. Jesus, your love is amazing. Wow. Arms in. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life up for me. Arms out. Please help me to follow your example in loving other people so that other people will see you when they look at my life. 
Amen. We're going to sing now, um, and it's a song with action. So if you're a child, or not a child, who'd like to come to the front and help us uh, as we do, as we sing together about God's great generosity to us in Jesus. Let's sing. Gift of Jesus, gift of Jesus, our God's generous, He gives to all of us, holding nothing back, He pours out His love. He sent Jesus Christ to be my sacrifice, the greatest gift from heaven above. of Jesus, gift of Jesus, our God's generous, he gives to all of us, holding nothing back, he pours out his love, he sent Jesus Christ to be my sacrifice, greatest gift from heaven above. Generous, he gives to all of us. My God's generous, he gives to all of us. generous to each one of us. Amen. Amen. Um, children and young people, it's your time to head out to your groups now. Um, for those of us still in the auditorium, just a couple of minutes to chat and say hello to the people around us and we'll have our Bible reading in two minutes. Good morning, folks. I'm Val and I'm a member of the church and I'd like to bring us the Bible reading for this morning. And that can be found in Ephesians 5. Probably a good idea if you either look on your phone or if you find the page in the Bible in front of you, which is page 1176. Page 1176 
Ephesians chapter 5, and we're starting at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Thank you very much, Val. And uh, yeah, it'd be great if you can uh, keep those verses open. Uh, for those of you who are new around here, my name's John Risbridger, one of the uh, ministers of the church. And uh, again, really glad to welcome you uh, to Above Bar today. Well, I don't know how you uh, reacted to the passage that was uh, just read to us, but just to kind of name it, um, it's a tricky passage for 21st century Western ears to hear, isn't it? And uh, I'm only going to be talking for about 15 minutes, so in a short talk, um, I'm not going to be able to answer every possible question. But I want to just say up front, as far as I can see, having looked at it quite closely, Paul is not here giving us the hierarchical view of marriage that people often assume he is, but rather what I'm going to call a reciprocal or a mutual view of marriage, which is actually very realistic and very relevant, and actually very important for us whether or not we are married. Actually, maybe like Paul who wrote these words, you're single, but you care about supporting marriages? If so, this is important for you as well. So I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to explain and convince you of what Paul is talking about here, and then I'm going to interview Helen Savage to help us see how some of this lands a bit more practically. I want you to remember, for those of you who've been here through this kind of study in Ephesians, I want you to remember how we got to where we are. This letter we call Ephesians is about God's ultimate plan to heal and unite a diverse and fragmented world in and through Jesus Christ. That's what it's about, healing a diverse, fragmented world so that it finds its unity in Jesus. And the call of this letter to Christians is to say that we are meant to live that unity now in all of our relationships and we've already had some kind of outline examples given as we've gone through uh, the second part of Ephesians. But the first one that Paul works out in real detail is the marriage relationship. Why does he do that? Well, I think it's because marriage is intended to be a particular and symbolic representation of two becoming one, of diversity being united 
in Jesus. In fact, you get exactly that language, quoting from Genesis in verse 31, talking about marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Male, female, diversity, united as one in marriage. So marriage is meant to be something of a picture of God's whole plan to bring unity to this diverse world. So what could be more important or indeed more challenging than to think about how the unity that Ephesians is speaking about would get lived in homes and families and marriages. This is where it all begins. And actually it is the most challenging space for it because this is the space where where life is shared and where the decisions of one person have the most direct and immediate implications for another person. If we can't work out unity here, we're not going to be able to work it out anywhere else. So that's how we got here. Second thing we need to realize is that the way that we hear Paul in these verses is in many ways the precise opposite to how he would have been heard in his own culture. Now, this is slightly controversial, so bear with me. Because the culture in which Paul wrote, although mixed in its view on men and women, was predominantly a culture which saw women as subordinate and actually inferior to men, and then regarded wives often as the possession of their husbands. That's the background into which Paul is speaking. Now, in that world, in that culture, Paul's talk about wives submitting to their husbands would barely have registered even as an issue. Now, the shock in what he's saying is in the way that he counterbalances and, to be honest, almost subverts the very idea of submission by telling husbands that they had no right to demand whatever that they wanted from their wives, but instead should give themselves up for their wives in costly sacrificial love, just in the way that we saw from the Kennedy family earlier on. But that was the real shock. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's the amazing bit in the text here. And I think if we're going to really hear Paul, we've got to realize that that was the corrective, that was the shock in what he said. The third thing we need to see is that everything Paul goes on to say in this passage is governed by the starting principle of mutual or reciprocal submission in verse 21. Verse 21, submit to one another, one another, note, everyone, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, a lot of writers really struggle with that verse because on the surface, it frankly doesn't make sense. The word in the, uh, in the Greek is the word hypertasso, and that usually implies an ordering of relationships where somebody is above someone else. It implies a one-way hierarchy, to call it what it is. But how can you have mutual submission in a one-way hierarchy. Doesn't make sense. You can't. Now, in a world which is rightly and deeply concerned about violence against women, telling husbands that they have unilateral authority over their wives is deeply problematic, which is why I am so glad that Paul didn't say that. He really doesn't. It's nowhere in the text here. To me, the only way to square the circle on mutual submission is to acknowledge that all the way through this section, Paul is intentionally redefining traditional power relationships, not as one-way hierarchies in which one person is always in charge, but as relationships of reciprocal counterbalancing responsibilities in which all of us, husbands, wives, managers, staff, parents, or children, to quote Philippians 2, verse 3, in humility value others above, note that word, above ourselves. All of us conducting our relationships that way. So within that context, what is Paul saying to wives and to husbands? Well, 
First of all, to wives, I think the best summary would be something like this. Wives, your husband is responsible before God to help you grow into everything God created you to be. So please, respect and respond to his initiative. That, as far as I can see, is the best way of understanding what Paul says. Verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands, uh, to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. So the call to submission here seems to be based on what Paul describes as the headship of the husband, which is itself modeled on Christ's headship in the church. Ah, we say, I've got it then. Paul's saying, when it comes to the home, the husband is the CEO. Not too fast. Don't go there. What does Paul actually mean by this picture of headship? Because actually it's a picture that has already appeared in Ephesians twice. Back in Ephesians 1 verse 22, Christ is head over all things for the church. Now in that context, his headship is clearly a headship of authority. But notice, in Ephesians 1, his headship is not over the church. His headship is over all things for the church. Profound distinction. But then the idea of headship occurs again in chapter 4 and in verses 15 and 16, where it's very, very different. You might want to just turn back and have a look. In the middle of uh, Ephesians 4 verse 15, uh, it talks about uh, Christ, who is the head. From him, from Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, I put it to you that that is the model that Paul has in mind when he's talking about the headship of Jesus over the church and the headship of the husband in relation to his wife. Because as Ephesians 5 goes on, this is exactly the language he uses of the husband having responsibility to see, the, uh, to see his wife grow and flourish and develop, which is exactly what is being described here in Ephesians chapter 4. So as head of the church, Christ is the source of its nurture, its growth, it's building up. He is its healer and its savior. And that is Paul's analogy for the husband's role. And as the husband takes the initiative to fulfill that role within the family, the submission of wives is to be respectful and responsive to that initiative rather than resistant or dismissive. But then to husbands, verse 25 and remember, this is the shock. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Did you, did you clock that? Did you clock it? There's not a shred of an instruction here to husbands to take authority, to assert themselves, to be in control. And frankly, to use what Paul says here to justify any kind of coercive control or power of husbands over their wives is completely out of order and completely to misunderstand what he's saying. We need to be clear about that. No, the call to husbands is a call to love and specifically to love as Christ loved the church, which means to give yourself up for your wife, verse 25. To seek her growth in purity and holiness, verses 26 and 7. And to care for her as tenderly and attentively as you care for yourself, verses 28 to 32. Because, and this is the argument if you follow it through there, you're to care for her as you care for yourself because as her husband, you are so profoundly one with her that to injure her or diminish her is to injure or diminish yourself. That's the language. That's the argument. To quote one scholar, Andrew Bartlett, if Ephesians 5 crowns the husband, 
it is with a crown of thorns, a reference to Jesus giving himself on the cross for the church. But what's the point of all this? Where does this land? Why is this even significant? It is all I'm trying to do this morning to say that somehow maybe Paul is kind of off the hook after all? No. The point is that Christian marriages are meant to be places of growth, of flourishing. Husbands, you have a job to do. And it isn't just to impose your will in your home. Neither is it just to have an easy life with nothing really to bother you. No, you have a task, which is to help your wife become all that God created her to be. That she should grow in godliness, in purity, in fruitfulness. That's your job. And it isn't a job that you can fulfill just by doing nothing. It's an active job. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. So here's the challenge to us as husbands, those of us that are husbands. What are we doing to help our wives become all that Jesus made them to be? That's where this passage lands. How does your example, my example, help our wives to grow? How does our attitude to church help our wives to grow? Or does it just feed them with cynicism and disappointment? How does your prayer life help your wife to grow? How do your choices prefer your wife and enrich her life to make her more like Jesus? That's where the rub of the passage is. Now, no one would ever teach that it isn't also right for a wife to love her husband, would they? We would all, can we agree on that? We would all say a wife should love her husband and should seek his growth and his flourishing. That's obvious. I want to say, if we are to take seriously what Paul says about mutual submission, I think we also have to say that it's right for husbands to submit to their wives too and to be responsive to their initiative. Let me tell you about our home. Do I, does Alison submit to me in everything? Do I take the lead in our home in everything? I'm sorry, I don't. And I don't know any healthy marriage that works like that. Because there's a whole pile of stuff where Alison is much better than me. And so I yield to her initiative. And yes, there are some areas where maybe I'm a little bit better than her. And she will yield to mine so that together we are so much stronger than we could be apart. And actually, how different anyway are these two commands to submit and to love? Just think about it. To submit is to give up our control to another, whereas to love is to give up our very selves to another. Can you see they're almost two sides of the same coin? They belong so closely together that we can drive no wedge between them. So this is Paul's vision of marriage, not hierarchical, but mutual, reciprocal, and beautiful, a relationship where husband and wife both help each other to thrive and to grow into all that Jesus made them to be. And of course, his vision for parenting is not identical, but it's fairly similar. We don't have time for a deep dive there. Just notice where it lands, verse 4. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Friends, that doesn't mean take your kids to church and hope you can contract out this responsibility to the youth and kids team. That's not what it means, okay? What it means is that God gives you that responsibility if you're a parent. He's entrusting you with the spiritual growth of any children that he brings into your family. Yes, of course, in partnership with others, but he's entrusting you with their spiritual growth and nurture. That's another whole sermon we don't have time for. But back to marriage for a moment. If Paul's vision is so reciprocal, why does he still, because he does, why does he still call wives to submission and husbands to love. Why does he? Well, 
not, as we've seen, because he's teaching a one-way hierarchy in marriage. So why then? Well, perhaps it is because he understands us better than we think. Perhaps it is because he understands that typically the deepest emotional needs of men and women are not quite the same, with men particularly often needing to know that they are respected and women particularly needing to know that they are loved. Of course, the converse is true as well. But the people who know about this stuff tell me that empirically this is exactly right, that typically women need to know that they are loved and that men particularly need to know that they are respected. And that, of course, is exactly where Paul lands in verse 33. Each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Well, if all of that feels a bit challenging, and I hope it does, it certainly does for me, two quick pieces of good news. The first is that, as Jonathan said to us a few weeks ago, the whole of this passage actually rests on the command in verse 18 to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're married, the Holy Spirit wants to be involved in your marriage. God is for your marriage and present by, your spirit, by his spirit within that marriage, standing with you to build and grow that partnership. But second, Human help is also at hand. Helen Savage is one of a number of people in our church with a great heart and shed loads of experience in supporting marriages. And so I'm going to ask her now just to come and help us explore some of this a little bit more practically. Helen, thanks so much. This is Helen, if you don't know her. And uh, Helen is the CEO of Southampton Family Trust. So, Helen, as you work with couples and relationships, just give us a bit of a sense of what that work is all about. Yeah, sure. So just to introduce myself, um, I know lots of you here, uh, but lots of you won't know me. So I'm Helen. I'm married to Tim. Uh, we've been married for about 22 years, and we've been coming to Above Bar since we turned up on the doorstep as an engaged couple and said we need marriage prep. We've been told we need marriage prep. And Paul and Di Alcock said, well, we can do that. <laughs> Just turned up out of nowhere. And we've been coming to Above Bar ever since. So 22 years. Um, so just a bit about my, uh, so my professional background is that I used to be a family lawyer. So working with couples, obviously, who were separating. Um, don't do that anymore. I now kind of have two jobs. So I ha I'm a family mediator. So I work with couples who are separating still with them both in the same room and trying to keep them out of court and help them to co-parent really well um, when they're living separately. And then my other job, which is three days a week, is I'm the CEO of Southampton Family Trust, which is a Christian charity which supports vulnerable families in Southampton. So we support all families, but we have a particular emphasis on families struggling with disadvantage, um, poverty, neglect, abuse. So lots and lots of big issues. Um, so my role kind of involves running the charity, doing all the boring stuff, the accounts, the funding applications, but also my particular focus is working with couples, uh, and this with trying to keep them together. Um, so we use something called Prepare and Rich, which is a relationship education tool that's quite widely used um, internationally, but less used in the UK. Um, I probably worked with a few hundred couples over the years, so I've um, been quite involved for a long time. Fantastic, thank you. So if I've understood you right, you, you work both with couples within the church and couples who who are not, wouldn't necessarily call themselves Christians. So I wonder, from that kind of combined experience, can you give us any sense of what you think are the particular um, challenges that Christian couples face and the way that faith can help people working through issues in marriage? Yes, yeah, so as, as John says, I do do a mixture of Christian and non-Christian couples. So we have lots of Christian couples referred in because we're a Christian charity, but then also lots of couples um, who are referred in by social services who are struggling with quite high levels of conflict in the home, so kind of see both sides. Um, definitely um, working with Christian marriages, um, one of the main differences for me is that our commitment as Christians is to our husbands or wives, but also to God in our marriage. Um, so unless there are some very, very good reasons for, um, example, abuse, um, or, uh, yeah, some, some really strong reasons, unless there are these very good reasons, then we are absolutely committed um, to staying in our marriages, uh, which means that we have no choice but to keep working through our issues. 
Um, so I have always found that quite helpful. I have to be careful because Tim's here. When I normally talk <laughs> and do this stuff, Tim is not here in the audience, so I could tell all sorts of stories, and he's never here to defend himself, but now he's watching. Um, so, um, but in, seriously, but so a, a while ago, I had a non-Christian friend said to me, um, who was trying to decide whether her marriage was the right thing, that she felt they'd grown apart, and she said that she really envied my lack of choice, that I had no choice but to stay in. I thought, actually, it is freeing to, to have that choice almost taken away, because my commitment is to God within my marriage as well. Um, one of the other ways I think it really helps is knowing that God is 100% behind your marriage. So um, I think that can really help you approach it differently. So often when couples are struggling, Christian couples are struggling, one of the main questions is how would, do you think that God is 100% behind your marriage? And if you do, what difference would that make to how you behave? Um, and that actually can transform um, some people's approach to their marriages. So it becomes... I was going to say, um, from a marriage that may be experiencing doubt to a marriage that has no doubt, but still has it, lots of issues and stuff to work through. Mm. So I think that's some of the main... Oh, I'm very well prepared. Look, I've got all my notes. <laughs> um, so, and then challenges. I think there are some challenges that are really specific to Christian couples. So uh, particularly see really high stress levels amongst Christian couples um, that we work with. And um, because they are heavily involved in church life and Christian life, um, and that can take up a lot of time and put a lot of demands on you emotionally. And sometimes if stress levels are very high, uh, you just don't have the emotional capacity to work on your marriage, keep engaged in your marriage, and also to work on issues that come up. Uh, so often we work with couples to look about reducing their stress levels. So I'm not standing here and saying don't get involved in church life and don't do anything at church, but uh, just, keep, just keep it all in balance. Um, I think I'm also sometimes... People in church may be a bit fearful of um, seeking support because they don't want to admit that things are difficult. Um, I think that can be quite hard. Um, and perhaps sometimes maybe we're not quite quick enough to get support around issues around abuse um, because we have a misplaced sense of loyalty um, and, um, and fear of speaking out. Hmm. So I think that's probably my main. Fantastic. Stuff. That's so helpful, so insightful. Um, hey, this is an impossible question for sort of a minute's answer, but just give us... Bullet points, a few top tips for building a healthy marriage. What would you say after yeah, all that experience? Yeah, oh gosh. So that's really hard. So where to start? So I asked, when I, John, I did know this question beforehand. So when John asked me, I asked some, um, some of the other, a part of a group that supports marriages across the South. And uh, I said, what would they say? And every single person said something different. <laughs> so I'm going to say, um, these are sort of some of the things that we came up with. So God at the center. Um, really important, I think, be realistic in your expectations of marriage. One of the things that I found really helpful is when I was working as a divorce lawyer, up as an, I was up in London, I hadn't even met Tim, I wasn't a Christian. We had a visit from a relationship charity called One Plus One, which was in its infancy then, but which now is one of the biggest charities. I don't know why they were coming to see divorce lawyers, but they were. So they said, um, they, they said it is completely and utterly normal in a happy and healthy marriage to have some really, really difficult patches, and that's okay. That doesn't mean there's a disaster. It doesn't mean you married the wrong person. That's normal. So I think being realistic and expecting difficult times um, is, is really important. Keep communicating. Um, if you try and develop some positive habits around communication when times are good, then those habits are in place um, when things get a bit more stressful and we have difficult times, which we all have. There's different seasons in everybody's life and in your marriages as well. Um, read books on communication in marriage, attend church marriage enrichments days. They're very good. Um, the other thing is date night. Again, it sounds really boring, but it's really important. Once a week, if you can, make, even if it doesn't have to be going out, just making time for yourselves. There's no way that you can develop a really good, strong relationship if you actually physically have no time with each other. But it is easy for that sort of stuff to, split, uh, to slip. Um, and there is some research that says um, that actually, if you're in a difficult season, so if you've got chil young children and it's almost impossible to go out and have any time with each other, um, then once a month is enough. This is what the research says. Once a month, just one evening a month together is enough to get your relationship through that patch, to keep you in tune enough to get through it until you come out the other side and you've got a bit more time with each other. I've got two more things, so I keep going. Go I'm on, going yeah, on. it's great so, stuff. Um, so, uh, so the other thing is small decisions make a difference. So um, really important to say, nobody sets out to have an affair, for example. Uh, really important to say no to the cup of coffee uh, before it becomes 
lunch out before it becomes a drink after work. So the small decisions at the beginning of things are really important. And the last one is seek support before um, issues become insurmountable. Thank you. Um, th th another tricky one, but the passage we just looked at is obviously pretty controversial. I, we've debated it a little bit as well. <laughs> I know some of it's, um, there are some interpretations of it that, uh, that you find tricky. But you're incredibly experienced at working with couples. And so from that work, what, what differences between the man and the woman does, does marriage often kind of highlight? And, and how do we then handle those within a marriage? Yeah. Just in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> There's no chance. Right, so really quickly, uh, I do tend more towards the mutual submitting part than the later verses, but, um, but obviously, John, actually, that sermon was, it was brilliant. I found that really thank helpful, you. so thank you. Um, just, so just really quickly, acknowledging our differences um, is just really important. Uh, apart from the obvious physical differences, there are other things that um, biologically are different. So, for example, men um, have less color cones in their eyes than um, women, apparently. So when men see purple, women see grape, lavender, um, all sorts of different colours. So when I hold up two shades of grey and ask my husband to tell me which one he prefers and he can't see the difference, he genuinely can't see the difference. <laughs> um, and I won't go on to uh, yeah, multitasking. But so, um, and the other, I think one of the other main differences, I'm trying to be really quick now. You're John, doing great, you're doing great. Gender differences between women, um, between men and women. Uh, one of the main things is that men, women tend to have closer female relationships with, with their friends, whereas men uh, can obviously, sometimes that's a bit less so. So sometimes in the marriages that are struggling, um, the male friends, ma the men have no close friends and they are dependent upon their, their wives for all their emotional support, which is impossible for any one person to provide. So male friendships, encouraging male friendships is, a, is really important. Mm. Um, so just, yeah, the, so, but I was gonna say that actually in my experience, working with Christian and non-Christian couples, it is absolutely true to say that I think men have a deep need to feel respected in their relationships and women have a deep need to feel loved. Uh, We've obviously, heard that before somewhere, haven't we? <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> so Thank obviously you. we do all need to feel respected and loved, as John said, but actually in the Christian and non-Christian couples, I, absolutely, that's been my personal experience in working with them as well. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, finally, if you could say one thing to any of us here who may be struggling <laughs> yeah. in our marriages right now, what would your, your first step piece of advice yeah, be? Yeah, just get support. Um, so Above Bar Church has a fantastic dedicated team um, to, who will support marriages. Um, I'm told that you go straight to Paul and Di Alcock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or you can email um, marriage support at abovebarchurch.org.uk. I think that's right. Yeah, so get support, don't hesitate, do it before it's too late. Fantastic. Okay. Helen, thank you so much. Can we express our appreciation? Thank you. Um, we're going to come to a time of communion now. Um, and I don't know about you, but um, I think for many of us, um, there's nothing like the people who are closest to us, um, our spouses, our parents, our children, um, or perhaps, perhaps the pain of not having those relationships in our lives um, to expose um, what's really going on in our hearts. Um, and maybe God has used the Bible this morning um, to expose regret or shame, uh, fear or disappointments. And that's why communion, uh, especially when we're uh, looking at a subject like family today, is a real privilege for us to be able to take and to celebrate together. For God is, um, through Jesus, he is um, the master heart surgeon and those, bit, those emotions and those feelings of brokenness, God longs to, um, to heal and to fill with his hope and his love and his peace. Uh, one of the verses that John's going to read in a minute from 1 Corinthians says, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I just want to point out two quick things that I think are really helpful um, for us today as we think about family. Um, which is firstly, as we take communion, we look back to the Lord's death. Jesus came to give his life for ours precisely because he knew that we weren't going to be able to live up to his ideals in human relationships. And as we take communion, we express trust that whatever burdens or brokenness we're carrying, we can bring them to the foot of his cross and leave them there and 
receive his forgiveness, his grace, and his love. And while looking back, we can also look forward and celebrate the fact that Jesus is coming back. And he will make everything that is wrong and hard right. And as we wait, we commit, to, um, we commit ourselves to living by his strength wholeheartedly for him. Laying down our lives for those around us and for him. As we think about these things, I imagine for many of us, there are situations or relationships that are really hard right now. Almost too hard to bear. And obedience to God, maybe following some of the things that John has said this morning, feel impossible. As we eat this bread and drink this wine, we declare our trust that Jesus is Lord. He has promised to help us and we ask him to help us to keep going, to keep following him, to keep trusting him until he returns. Let's just take a moment to ponder what God might be saying to each one of us this morning. And so, Lord Jesus, we bring to the foot of your cross our failings, our shame, our regrets. We confess our sins. And we rejoice that there is more grace in you than there is sin in us. And so we receive your forgiveness. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you too for these gifts of bread and wine. Through which we are called to remember you and your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you that you invite us not just to look at them but to eat and drink. And in doing so to respond to you as you reach towards us in grace. So grant that we may feed on you in our hearts by faith as we eat and drink. Amen. We uh, welcome you to share communion with us, uh, whatever your church background and tradition may be. Um, if you are not yet a Christian, then we'd encourage you not to kind of do something that's dishonest. This is very much an expression of living faith in Jesus. And if that's not where you are, then by all means, just stay seated as we share communion and ponder what you've seen and heard this morning. There's no uh, embarrassment in that. We just encourage integrity. But for all of us who are looking to Jesus this morning, we invite you to eat and to drink. It was on the night when Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Because when you eat this bread and when you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we proclaim it to our hearts. We proclaim it to one another. We proclaim it to a world that needs this good news as we eat and drink. So uh, if you're uh, taking communion, I, I want to invite now our servers just to come forward so that they're ready to serve you. And uh, please move towards whichever station is nearest to you. There's gluten-free as well as uh, normal bread on each of the tables. So let's come, let's remember, let's eat, let's drink.
for those of us who have uh, taken communion, why don't we stand together and we'll sing a song that focuses our minds on the cross, on what we're remembering that Jesus has done for us. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the laying down our lives for other people. Um, and I'm delighted, we've only got a few minutes, but um, to welcome Di and Paul um, Alcock, who head up our marriage ministry. Um, and they're just, just going to briefly share with us um, a little bit about their um, experience. So what I've asked them is just to kind of share an example of where the other in your marriage has lived out some of what John's been sharing today and the impact that that has had on you. 
Um, thank, thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think very early in our marriage, recognizing that God has made us equal partners in marriage, we also saw that there are roles within our marriage to be fulfilled so that it works on a day-to-day -day basis. And very early, Di said to me, I want to be the follower in this marriage and I want you to lead. And she has chosen willingly that role and found and believed it to be a totally fulfilling role as a wife. And she has encouraged me deeply throughout our marriage to take responsibility and to care and to love, seeking to build me up spiritually so that in some small way I might um, love her as Christ loved the church. It's, it's a long journey. We've been on it for over 50 years and we still have a lot to learn. But God has done things for us that show us that he is faithful. Without that, marriages, I don't know how people build marriages without God's strength. I just feel very humbled and moved by this whole service and just remembering and realizing it is all of the grace of God. We, we, we met um, very young and I wasn't even a Christian and God has been so faithful to us. I just want one example. Um, Paul, Paul always listens to me. He always values me. He always makes me feel I have, yeah, my contribution really matters. And um, one example was when um, we were thinking about going to Uganda. Well, Paul was thinking about going to Uganda <laughs> when he retired from here. And I really didn't want to even think about it. It seemed a dippy idea and why would we? <laughs> um, and... And God never, um, in God's grace, Paul never pushed me. He just, um, we talked about it and I never felt pushed. And I, I don't think we would have gone if I hadn't been happy eventually for it. And it was a very significant um, spiritual experience for me to come to the point where I was willing to go. And now, nearly 10 years on, God has blessed us and is still blessing us. In some ways, Patricia being here is part of that, saying yes to God to go to Uganda. So um, I'm deeply thankful. And Paul, listening and valuing me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I, can I just say, the, the other thing that I think is really important is that when the Bible uses that word submit and submission, I still have trouble in my head getting rid of that image of somebody standing on somebody else's head forcing submission. I don't think biblical submission is ever forced. I think it's a willing choice. And we're learning that. Please don't think this is anything like a perfect marriage because if you saw our home, you would certainly know it wasn't. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, we're going to pray now for marriages, but also just for a few other things as well. Father, we want to pray for marriages in our church family today. Please would couples know your help, your joy, and your protection as they seek to love one another. Pray for parents. Would they experience your wisdom, help, and patience as they seek to share Jesus with their children? Please would Jesus truly be experienced at the center of every home in our church. Pray for those who are struggling, particularly with marriages or parenting today. Please draw near to them, Father, and help them. Will they experience your love, help, and wisdom in how to move forward? Pray for grandparents, godparents, children's and youth teams, wider family and church family. Please would you show us all how we can play our part in supporting marriages and families in our church. Pray for Matt Lucas um, and pray for Sim Carter as he starts his role as associate children's worker today. Please help them both, Lord, bless them and guide them. This morning, Father, too, we want to pray for those in our church family who aren't married but would love to be. Um, please, God, would they experience you drawing alongside them, particularly this morning. Pray, too, that they would experience family um, through relationships of our church family, Lord. Father, too, we want to turn our eyes to our world and particularly to Ukraine. 
We do praise you for the glimpses of your hand we see at work and for answered prayers. And in confidence, therefore, God, we want to ask for more. We ask for peace. We ask you to frustrate the plans of those seeking to bring harm and violence. We pray for diplomatic resolutions and for breakthroughs in relationships. We ask that refugees would be able to safely be able to leave the country and that aid would be able to get to those who need it. We pray for those here this morning and in our church family who are preparing to welcome refugees from Ukraine. Please, would they experience your love and welcome through the love they experience from our church. And finally, Father, we lift ourselves to you. You know our situations, what our week ahead holds, the worries, the struggles. You love us, you're faithful, you're good, and you're Lord. Please help us this week to fix our eyes on you and in every way to live a life worthy of you. We ask that we would know your help, your protection, and your providence, not for our good, but so that you would get much glory through us, Father. Amen. We're going to stand now and sing, um, asking, um, yeah, seeking to make Jesus Lord of our lives and celebrating the Lord that he is over everything. Shall we stand together?
as we stand. Just take a moment to make Jesus king of your life this week. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for how you've spoken to us. Thank you that you go with us into this week. Please help us to live for you, to breathe for you in every situation, in every conversation, Father. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats. Um, Parents, if you could go fairly swiftly to go and collect your children from groups, that would be wonderful. Um, Just a couple of quick notices. Um, If anything has struck you this morning and you would like to pray with someone, um, please don't leave before doing that. Just come and sit at the front and somebody would love to come and pray with you. Um, Secondly, Helen has bought loads of really helpful resources from Southampton Family Trust, so come and find her down here if you'd like to collect some of those. Um, A couple of other things. Um, If you're a dad, Nick, my husband, has found this super helpful. It's called Dad Tired and Loving It. And there's also a podcast that's all about seeking to to parent um, your children in a really kind of gospel-centered way. And similarly for mums, um, there's a podcast called Risen Motherhood. Sounds really cheesy, but it's absolutely brilliant. Super practical, really short episodes. They've got a book as well just about applying the gospel to different areas of parenting. Um, And yeah, another quick podcast, which I know Jane Watkins has mentioned loads, is Faith in Kids. There's loads of really helpful resources on there. There's one this week, which was about um, parenting when we feel completely overwhelmed at the the end of ourselves, which I totally recommend. So um, yeah, if you're a parent, um, check those out. A couple of other quick things is we've got an alpha and newcomers courses starting on the 27th of April. Um, If you're interested in finding out about more um, or um, inviting people to come, um, the... um, uh, the email addresses are just behind me. Um, and then finally, um, there, is, there will be giving buckets on the way out if you would like to give to the work of the church. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thanks.